Hello, this is Shmuel Moshe, and you are listening to the Weekly Parsha Cast, a weekly Torah portion podcast where I read the weekly Torah portion and then give my own interpretation based on my understanding of the text. As always, I'd like to remind you that I am not a Torah scholar by any professional means, just somebody who wanted to study the Torah. Now, this week's Torah portion is falling on the 17th of Shavat, 5784, January 27th, 2024, and it is for Exodus chapter 13, verse 17. Beshalach, this week's Torah portion, translates to when he sent. Let's go ahead and jump right in, starting with the first portion, chapter 13, verse 17. It came to pass when Pharaoh let the people go, that God did not lead them by way of the land of the Philistines, for it was near. Because God said, Lest the people reconsider when they see war and return to Egypt. So God led the people around by way of the desert to the Red Sea, and the children of Israel were armed when they went out of Egypt. Moses took Joseph's bones with him, for he, Joseph, had adjured the sons of Israel, saying, God will surely remember you, and you shall bring up my bones from here with you. They traveled from Sukkoth, and they encamped in Etham, at the edge of the desert. And the Lord went before them by day in a pillar of cloud to cause it to lead them on the way, and at night in a pillar of fire to give them light. They could thus travel day and night. He did not move away the pillar of cloud by day or the pillar of fire at night from before the people. Chapter 14 The Lord spoke to Moses, saying, Speak to the children of Israel, and let them turn back and encamp in front of pi Hahirot between Migdol and the sea, in front of Baal-Zephon. You shall encamp opposite it by the sea. And Pharaoh will say about the children of Israel, They are trapped in the land, the desert has closed in upon them. And I will harden Pharaoh's heart, and he will pursue them, and I will be glorified through Pharaoh and through his entire force. And the Egyptians will know that I am the Lord, and they did so. It was reported to Pharaoh that the people had fled. And Pharaoh and his servants had a change of heart toward the people. And they said, What is this that we have done, that we have released Israel from serving us? So he, Pharaoh, harnessed his chariot and took his people with him. He took six hundred select chariots and all the chariots of Egypt with officers over them all. And the Lord hardened the heart of Pharaoh, the king of Egypt, and he chased after the children of Israel. And the children of Israel were marching out triumphantly. So to wrap up first the beginning here, it acknowledges that the reason that they did not go by the way of the land of the Philistines is that by going through that land, they would have been face to face with a conflict. And the idea was if they go through a conflict, what's going to happen? They're going to be like, oh, this is too tough. We want to go home. There's, we don't want to be dealing with all this war. So we want to go back to Egypt. So that's the reason that they end up going the long way. They go through the wilderness, essentially, and we get the name of the different locations. And the pillar of fire is there to give them light and also the pillar of smoke, right, the cloud, uh, to shield them and guide them. So they're able to travel whenever they need to go. They're able to move. And it's basically stating that at all times, this pillar was there to support them. Now, with that being said, We also are reminded that Moses took the bones of Joseph as he was expected to do. And beyond that, it's a warning. Moses is basically told from God, listen, the Egyptians are going to come after you. And I want you right here. You're going to go to this spot. They're going to change their minds and they're going to want to come take you back because they that's exactly how it's going to go. Sure enough. Meanwhile, in Egypt, The Egyptians are like, we want to take them back. What were we doing letting go a bunch of slaves that were working for us? We need to go and reclaim them. So Pharaoh marches out with 600 chariots and officers, and he's ready to go. And sure enough, the whole plan here is through the Pharaoh's actions, the Lord will be glorified. Now we move into the second portion. And keep in mind, the people of Israel are now trapped between two locations. They are are basically landlocked and with the sea behind them, they, they have nowhere to go. Second portion, chapter 14, verse 9. The Egyptians chased after them and overtook them, and camped by the sea every horse of Pharaoh's chariots. His horsemen and his force besides Pihairot, in front of Baal Zephon. Pharaoh drew near, and the children of Israel lifted up their eyes, and behold, the Egyptians were advancing after them. They were very frightened, and the children of Israel cried out to the Lord. They said to Moses, Is it because there are no graves in Egypt that you have taken us to die in the desert? What is this that you have done to take us out of Egypt? Isn't this the thing about which we spoke to you in Egypt, saying, Leave us alone and we will serve the Egyptians, because we would rather serve Egyptians than die in the desert? Moses said to the people, Don't be afraid. Stand firm and see the Lord's salvation that he will wreak for you today. For the way you have seen the Egyptians is only today. But you shall no longer continue to see them for eternity. The Lord will fight for you. 
but you shall remain silent. And so, as promised, all is going according to plan. The Egyptians catch up, and now the people are terrified. And they're saying, Moses, what has happened here? This is what we said. We said we'd rather just stay in Egypt and be slaves than be killed in unmarked graves in the desert. Why did you lead us out? And Moses is basically saying, relax. You may only know them as slave masters, but that's how it ends today. After today, that's going to be no more. Stay calm, stand firm, believe in the Lord, and witness the miracles that are about to happen. The Lord will fight for you. You shall remain silent. Third portion. Chapter 14, verse 15. The Lord said to Moses, Why do you cry out to me? Speak to the children of Israel and let them travel. And raise you your staff and stretch out your hand over the sea and split it. And the children of Israel shall come in the midst of the sea on dry land. And I, behold, I shall harden the hearts of the Egyptians and they will come after you. And I will be glorified through Pharaoh and through all his forces, through his chariots and through his horsemen. And the Egyptians shall know that I am the Lord when I will be glorified through Pharaoh, through his chariots and through his horsemen. Then the angel of God, who had been going in front of the Israelite camp, moved and went behind them, and the pillar of the cloud moved away in front of them and stood behind them. And he came between the camp of Egypt and the camp of Israel, and there were the cloud and the darkness, and it illuminated the night, and one did not draw near the other all night long. And Moses stretched out his hand over the sea, and the Lord led the sea with a strong east wind all night, and he made the sea into dry land, and the waters split. Then the children of Israel came into the midst of the sea on dry land, and the waters were to them as a wall from their right and from their left. The Egyptians pursued and came after them all Pharaoh's horses, his chariots, and his horsemen into the midst of the sea. It came about in the morning, watched that the Lord looked down over the Egyptian camp through a pillar of fire and cloud, and he threw the Egyptian camp into confusion. And he removed the wheels of their chariots, and he led them with heaviness. And the Egyptians said, Let me run away from the Israelites, because the Lord is fighting for them against the Egyptians. And so, now we get the actual play-by-play of what happens here. Moses is basically being told, What are you talking to me for? Go tell your people to get moving. And also, while you're at it, raise your staff, do these things, and I'm going to split the sea open for you. And so, while that's happening, I'm going to make sure that the Egyptians experience what they need to experience and have just the right amount of courage so that they can know to be afraid of me. And with that being said, they start marching, and the angel of God, who had been going in front of the Israelite camp, right? So the pillar of cloud and fire and all that, it moves from in front of them to behind them. So what it does is it builds like a a barrier to obscure the people of Israel as they are now getting ready for this big miracle of the sea splitting. And the cloud and the darkness and everything make it impossible for the Egyptians to see, but also there's, there's light so that the Israelites can see. So the two sides... Basically, they make it clear that both sides are going to stay on their own side for the rest of this event. Moses does what he's told, and all night long, it basically says uh, that the wind comes through and and causes the water to split, right? So I think a lot of depictions of the splitting of the sea tend to be Moses is there at the last possible moment, and it just happens in an instant. But it says here that it took place all night, right? So the wind was basically rushing in and changing the tide and causing this, this what would be kind of like a sandbar, if not for the fact that the walls of the water are being held upright. And so um, maybe we can look at it like the wind is still blowing and causing this to happen, thus pushing the water to the sides. The exact details of how are not clear, other than this is happening through the power of the wind and, the, of course, the miracles of the Lord. Now, while this is also going on, over in the Egyptian camp, the Lord is in battle and is actively harassing the Egyptian troops, messing with their chariots, completely ripping things apart, causing the wheels of their chariots to come off and making just everything difficult for them. And this now brings them fear. And they're like, let me get out of here because their God is is fighting us. And so there we go into the fourth portion. Chapter 14, verse 26 Thereupon the Lord said to Moses, Stretch out your hand over the sea, and let the water return upon the Egyptians, upon their chariots, and upon their horsemen. So Moses stretched out his hand over the sea, and toward morning the sea returned to its strength. And as the Egyptians were fleeing toward it, and the Lord stirred the Egyptians into the sea, and the waters returned and covered the chariots and the horsemen, and the entire force of Pharaoh coming after them into the sea, not even one of them survived. But the children of Israel went on dry land in the midst of the sea, and the water was to them like a wall from their right and from their left. 
On that day the Lord saved Israel from the hands of the Egyptians, and Israel saw the Egyptians dying on the seashore. And Israel saw the great hand which the Lord had used upon the Egyptians, and the people feared the Lord, and they believed in the Lord and in Moses his servant. Chapter 15, verse 1. Then Moses and the children of Israel sang this song to the Lord, and they spoke, saying, I will sing to the Lord, for very exalted is he, a horse and its rider he cast into the sea. The eternal strength and his vengeance were my salvation, that is my God, and I will make him a habitation, the God of my father, and I will ascribe to him exaltation. The Lord is a master of war, the Lord is his name. Pharaoh's chariots and his army he cast into the sea, the elite officers sank in the Red Sea. The depths covered them, they descended into the depths like a stone. Your right hand, O Lord, is most powerful. Your right hand, O Lord, crushes the foe. And with your great pride you tear down those who rise up against you. You send forth your burning wrath, it devours them like straw. And with the breath of your nostrils the waters were heaped up. The running water stood erect like a wall, the depths congealed in the hearts of the sea. Because the enemy said, I will pursue, I will overtake, I will share the booty, my desire will be filled from them. I will draw my sword, my hand will impoverish them. You blew with your wind, the sea covered them, they sank like lead into the powerful waters. Who is like you among the powerful, O Lord? Who is like you, powerful in the holy place? Too awesome for praises, performing wonders. You inclined your right hand, the earth swallowed them up. With your loving kindness you led the people you redeemed. You led them with your might to your holy abode. Peoples heard, they trembled, a shudder seized the inhabitants of Philistia. Then the chieftains of Edom were startled. As for the powerful men of Moab, trembling seized them, all the inhabitants of Canaan melted. May dread and fright fall upon them. With the arm of your greatness may they become as still as stone, until your people cross over, O Lord, until this nation that you have acquired crosses over. You shall bring them and plant them on the mount of your heritage, directed toward your habitation, which you made, O Lord, the sanctuary, O Lord, which your hands founded. The Lord will reign to all eternity." When Pharaoh's horses came with his chariots and his horsemen into the sea, and the Lord brought the waters of the sea back upon them, and the children of Israel walked on dry land in the midst of the sea, Miriam the prophetess, Aaron's sister, took a timbrel in her hand, and all the women came out after her with timbrels and with dances. And Miriam called out to them, Sing to the Lord, for very exalted is he, a horse and its rider he cast into the sea. Moses led Israel away from the Red Sea, and they went out into the desert of Shur. They walked for three days in the desert, but did not find water. They came to Marah, but they could not drink water from Marah because it was bitter. Therefore it was named Marah. The people complained against Moses, saying, What shall we drink? So he cried out to the Lord, and the Lord instructed him concerning a piece of wood, which he cast into the water, and the water became sweet. There he gave them a statute and an ordinance, and there he tested them. And he said, If you hearken to the voice of the Lord your God, and you do what is proper in his eyes, and you listen closely to his commandments, and observe all his statutes, all the sicknesses that I have visited upon Egypt I will not visit upon you, for I, the Lord, heal you. All right, so that was quite a long song of the sea, eh? So let's break it down. After the Egyptians are pursuing them into the water, they are now trailing behind the Israelites, and then Moses is told, raise your hand out over the ocean, over the sea again, and I'm going to bring it all down. And so just as he does so, the water crashes onto the Egyptians, and they are drowned. And it is an absolutely overwhelming sight. What a powerful miracle this is to see a single tactical annihilation of the enemy in one fell swoop of water. And so for the entirety of chapter 15, it's just a song of the sea, of all of them singing, right? They're just singing of all this amazing stuff. And they talk about things that have yet to happen. Uh, they do talk about being set free and they talk about, you know, they're marching out and all that. But the other thing is that they talk about the upcoming different peoples who they're going to be going by, the Philistines and the Moabites and so on, the Edomites. And basically the idea is they're saying these peoples will be afraid until we pass through. They're going to just back down because they're afraid of us, because they're afraid of the Lord. The Lord is going to guide us through. So let's sing songs of praise to that Lord. We see Miriam, Aaron's sister, the one who followed baby Moses along the Nile. Here she is leading the women in song as well. And then another miracle happens. They are able to get some 
water, some sweet water, right? The water's bitter, but then they are able by following the, the commandment given by God, he tells Moses, throw this, this wood in there. He gives him some commands and he does so and the water becomes sweet enough to drink. And so we just also see another affirmation, you know, uh, as long as you obey and do as I've told you and observe everything, you're not going to suffer what the Egyptians suffered. So that is their, their heads up. Now moving into the fifth portion, chapter 15, verse 27. They came to Elim, and there were twelve water fountains and seventy palms, and they encamped there by the water. Chapter 16, verse 1. They journeyed from Elim, and the entire community of the children of Israel came to the desert of Sin, which is between Elim and Sinai, on the fifteenth day of the second month after their departure from the land of Egypt. The entire community of the children of Israel complained against Moses and against Aaron in the desert. The children of Israel said to them, If only we had died by the hand of the Lord in the land of Egypt, when we sat by pots of meat, when we ate bread to our fill, for you have brought us out into this desert to starve this entire congregation to death. So the Lord said to Moses, Behold, I am going to rain down for you bread from heaven, and the people shall go out and gather what is needed for the day so that I can test them, whether or not they will follow my teaching. And it shall be on the sixth day that when they prepare what they will bring, it will be double of what they gather every day. Thereupon Moses and Aaron said to all the children of Israel, In the evening you shall know that the Lord brought you out of the land of Egypt, and in the morning you shall see the glory of the Lord when he hears your complaints against the Lord. But of what significance are we that you make the people complain against us? And Moses said, When the Lord gives you in the evening meat to eat and bread in the morning with which to become sated, when the Lord hears your complaints which you are making, the people complain against him, but of what significance are we? Not against us are your complaints, but against the Lord's. And Moses said to Aaron, Say to the entire community of the children of Israel, Draw near before the Lord, for he has heard your complaints. And it came to pass when Aaron spoke to the entire community of the children of Israel that they turned toward the desert, and behold, the glory of the Lord appeared in the cloud. So basically, they arrive in this place, and as they're here and journeying and journeying, they're now in the desert of Sin, which is between Elim and Sinai, or Sinai, as some people know it in the English, right? And so they're now getting really frustrated, the people. They're saying, we're hungry. Why did you drag us out of Egypt? You know what? It would have been better to die in Egypt, because at least there we had good food, okay? But instead, you brought us out here to die in the desert with no food. It would have been better to die as slaves by the hand of the Lord and have something to eat at least before we died. And basically Moses and Aaron are like, well, we got to relay this to the big man. And they do. And basically the Lord says to them, okay, well, uh, we're going to fix that. So I'm going to make sure that there is something there for them. Uh, I'm going to bring some goodies down from the sky and there's going to be enough for them to gather every week. Except for on the sixth day, there will be a double portion because, again, the Sabbath, right? The next day is the Sabbath. So take double on the sixth day so that you have for the Sabbath. But anyway, yeah, I'm going to fix this. So don't you worry. You let the people know. We're, we're going to test their faith a little bit. And Moses and Aaron basically relay the information to the Israelites. And they also say, now, keep this in mind, folks. When you complain to us, you're not really complaining to us. What you're actually doing is complaining against God. So when you complain, when we follow God's instructions, you're actually criticizing the Lord. Just keep that in mind. Okay, great. Now, with that in mind, uh, we also have some good news. He has heard your complaints. So now let's turn it over to our main man over here. God, any comments? And then suddenly there's God in the desert. Once again, the glorious cloud of the Lord. Now we move into the sixth portion. It's time to hear what the Lord has to say. Chapter 16, verse 11. The Lord spoke to Moses, saying, I have heard the complaints of the children of Israel. Speak to them, saying, In the afternoon you shall eat meat, and in the morning you shall be sated with bread, and you shall know that I am the Lord your God. It came to pass in the evening that the quails went up and covered the camp, and in the morning there was a layer of dew around the camp. The layer of dew went up, and behold, on the surface of the desert, a fine bare substance as fine as frost on the ground. When the children of Israel saw it, they said to one another, it is manna, because they did not know what it was. And Moses said to them, It is the bread that the Lord has given you to eat. This is the first thing that the Lord has commanded. Gather of it each one according to his eating capacity, an omer for each person, according to the number of persons, each one for those in his tent you shall take. And the children of Israel did so. They gathered both the one who gathered much and the one who gathered little. And they measured it with an omer, and whoever gathered much did not have more, and whoever gathered little did not have less. Each one according to his eating capacity they gathered. And Moses said to them, Let no one leave over any of it until morning. 
But some men did not obey Moses, and left over some of it until morning, and it bred worms and became putrid, and Moses became angry with them. They gathered it morning by morning, each one according to his eating capacity, and when the sun grew hot, it melted. It came to pass on the sixth day that they gathered a double portion of bread, two omers for each one. And all the princes of the community came and reported it to Moses. So he said to them, That is what the Lord spoke. Tomorrow is a rest day, a holy Sabbath to the Lord. Bake whatever you wish to bake, and cook whatever you wish to cook, and all the rest leave over to keep until morning. So they left it over until morning, as Moses had commanded, and it did not become putrid, and not a worm was in it. And Moses said, Eat it today, for today is a Sabbath to the Lord. Today you will not find it in the field. Six days you shall gather it, but on the seventh day, which is the Sabbath, on it there will be none. It came about that on the seventh day some of the people went out to gather manna, but they did not find any. The Lord said to Moses, How long will you refuse to observe my commandments and my teachings? See that the Lord has given you the Sabbath, therefore on the sixth day he gives you bread for two days. Let each man return in his place, let no man leave his place on the seventh day. So the people rested on the seventh day. The house of Israel named it manna, and it was like coriander seed. It was white and it tasted like a wafer with honey. Moses said, This is the thing that the Lord commanded. Let one omer full of it be preserved for your generations, in order that they see the bread that I fed you in the desert when I took you out of the land of Egypt. And Moses said to Aaron, Take one jug and put there an omer full of manna, and deposit it before the Lord to be preserved for your generations. As the Lord had commanded Moses, Aaron deposited it before the testimony to be preserved. And the children of Israel ate the manna for forty years until they came to an inhabited land. They ate the manna until they came to the border of the land of Canaan. The omer is one-tenth of an ephah. So to summarize, once again, uh, we got the promise about we're going to take care of this problem. So the Lord shows up. He's heard the complaints. So let them know we're going to, this is their diet. Okay. I'm going to let you know now, let them all know when they're going to be able to eat in the afternoon. They're going to eat meat in the morning. They're going to be sated with bread. And you'll know that it was me because I just told you it's going to happen. Sure enough, quails came in the afternoon, and in the morning, the dew around the camp on the surface of the desert, they found the manna. They didn't know what to call it, so they called it manna, and it's basically the, it is the sacred holy gift, this bread that they are given, that tastes kind of like honey and coriander and all that jazz. But anyway, uh, they're basically told, go out there and get as much as, you, uh, to your, based on your needs, right? So gather as much as you can eat. Don't get more, don't get less, just get what you need. And Omer full, like basically Omer is relating to like the sentence, the census. So they're getting enough for themselves, right? Get as much as you need just for you. Okay. One for each person, every household, according to their need. And they do so. Moses also tells them, listen to me, don't take more and don't try to leave any until morning. Okay. Don't do that. But some people, they're kind of, you know, they don't trust it yet, so they keep it overnight anyway. And the next morning, it's disgusting. It's putrid. It's got worms in it. It's horrible. And the Lord is mad. Moses is mad, of course, but the Lord is also going to be mad. And I think that's part of why Moses is angry, because every time they disobey Moses, they're disobeying something that the Lord told him to relay. So Moses is getting irritated. Well, what ends up happening is... On the Sabbath day upcoming, just as I mentioned before, on the sixth day, they're told you're going to get a double portion, okay? You're going to get twice as much because you're going to be able to eat it that day and then enough for the next day also. But of course, even though he told them don't do it, they went out the next day on the Sabbath and they went to go look for more manna. And of course, there was none. Now, on the other hand, the manna that they had double of did not go bad. So this is proof that the manna is meant to be eaten on the Sabbath collected the day before a double portion. Now, on top of that, when they go out to do this, this really makes God mad. And the Lord says to Moses, like, how long are you going to keep doing things I told you not to do? I told you the Sabbath is a holy day. Go home and stay home. Got it? And so Moses relays the message and now they understand. Now, it also comes to pass that as a symbol of this miracle, Aaron is told, This is the thing the Lord commanded. Let one portion of this, one one portion of manna, go put it in a jar, basically. Like, go, go, go preserve it and put it as a symbol of this miracle so that the generations in the future can see this thing and say, like, this is proof that what we're telling you happened here for real. So Aaron does as he's told. He gets a portion and he puts it away for posterity to be preserved. And... He keeps it. Now, with that, for 40 years, 
They eat the manna until they came to a land on the border of Canaan. And then, of course, an omer is one-tenth of an ephah, just for measurement's sake. That's your summary there for verse six, or portion 6. Now for the final portion. Chapter 17, verse 1. The entire community of the children of Israel journeyed from the desert of Sin to their travels by the mandate of the Lord. They encamped in Rephidim, and there was no water for the people to drink. So the people quarreled with Moses, and they said, Give us water that we may drink. Moses said to them, Why do you quarrel with me? Why do you test the Lord? The people thirsted there for water, and the people complained against Moses, and they said, Why have you brought us from Egypt to make me and my children and my livestock die of thirst? Moses cried out to the Lord, saying, What shall I do for this people? Just a little longer and they will stone me. And the Lord said to Moses, Pass before the people, and take with you some of the elders of Israel, and take into your hand your staff with which you struck the Nile, and go. Behold, I shall stand there before you on the rock in Horeb, and you shall strike the rock, and water will come out of it, and the people will drink. Moses did so before the eyes of the elders of Israel. He named the place Massah and Meribah, because of the quarrel of the children of Israel, and because of their testing the Lord, saying, Is the Lord in our midst or not? Amalek came and fought with Israel in Rephidim. So Moses said to Joshua, Pick men for us, and go out and fight against Amalek. Tomorrow I will stand on top of the hill with the staff of God in my hand. Joshua did as Moses had told him, to fight against Amalek. And Moses, Aaron, and Hur ascended to the top of the hill. It came to pass that when Moses would raise his hand, Israel would prevail. And when he would lay down his hand, Amalek would prevail. Now Moses' hands were heavy, so they took a stone and placed it under him, and he sat on it. Aaron and Hur supported his hands, one from this side and one from that side, so he was with his hands in faith until sunset. Joshua weakened Amalek and his people with the edge of the sword. The Lord said to Moses, Inscribe this as a memorial in the book, and recite it into Joshua's ears, that I will surely obliterate the remembrance of Amalek from beneath the heavens. Then Moses built an altar, and he named it, The Lord is my miracle. And he said, For there is a hand on the throne of the Eternal, that there shall be a war for the Lord against Amalek from generation to generation. Thus concludes the seventh portion. So here we have even more testing from the people of Israel. They get to this place called Rephidim, and there's no water. Now they start complaining again. And Moses is like, what, what are you coming at me for? Why are you testing me? Why are you attacking me and complaining against the Lord here? What, what's with the test? And they said, well, once again, Moses, uh, yeah, it's great that you've done all this other stuff, but why did you go ahead and bring us into the desert just to die of thirst? Maybe we should have stayed in Egypt where we wouldn't have died of thirst, huh? How about that? And now they're getting really rowdy and Moses basically cries out to the Lord. He's like, God, help me out here. These people, I what do I do for these people? If, I, if this keeps up, they're going to stone me. They're going to pelt me with rocks and kill me. And so the Lord tells them what to do. He basically guides him on what he needs to do to bring the elders before the people of Israel to kind of calm them down. And then using the staff, which he used to strike the Nile, uh, you're going to hit this rock and water's going to come out of it and the people will be able to drink. And so the place was named Massah, which means testing, and Meribah, which means quarreling because they quarreled with Israel, with you know, Moses and Israel quarreled, right? And they also tested the Lord on whether or not he was actually with them. Now, the next thing that happens is that they get attacked by a group of people called the Amalek, Amalek or Amalekites, right? So Amalek, they basically come in and they, they are the one group of people who are not so afraid that they actually have the audacity to start a war. And so the war begins. Joshua is assigned to lead the, the troops. Moses goes up and he is basically going to hold his arms up in order to channel the power of the Lord into his people. And his arms, every time they go down, the power shifts in favor of Amalek. So Moses has to keep his arms up the entire battle. Now Aaron and her help him keep his arms up. So all through the night, basically from day into night they manage to do this and they succeed and they're able to push off fend off Amalek with their blades and eventually thanks to the power of the Lord they are able to withstand their enemy and Moses is told to inscribe this into the book right so the Lord tells Moses make sure you jot this down and also tell it to Joshua I will surely obliterate the remembrance of Amalek from beneath the heavens. 
So this is entirely, this is like a very significant piece of Jewish history, this section of Amalek, right? And I've heard this before, the origins of Amalek, uh, who the lineage they come from. I, I believe, I may be mistaken, I believe it might be from Esau, Esau, right? Uh, Jacob's brother. And as a consequence, I think also this is where he hid his daughter Dina from Esau. And it was the idea of if he had given his daughter or let his daughter be seen by Esau, maybe she would have led Esau on a path of righteousness. But instead, he ended up siring Amalek. I, I think that's, I believe that's the case. I may be mistaken. That's just something I remember hearing before. But basically, going back generationally, Amalek is a consequence of Jacob's behavior. They exist because of that. So it's very interesting to see how this sort of thing manifests from a decision that generationally was made many, many years ago. Now how it impacts his descendants. In any case, uh, what what happens here is there's a clear order. Write this in the book and also make sure that your successor hears this. Make sure Joshua knows. I'm going to obliterate the remembrance of Amalek from beneath the heavens. After that, Moses builds an altar and he names it the Lord is my miracle. And for there is a hand on the throne of the eternal that there shall be a war for the Lord against Amalek from generation to generation. So basically, this is a perpetual blood feud. Moses has declared without any question, Amalek is the enemy and all generations will be at war with Amalek. So interestingly, all of the other peoples that get passed through, there's nothing like this. Amalek is the most significant other group that they find while they're traveling in the desert and dealing with all these things. And it's very interesting to just see, like, this is so serious. How dare they, the audacity of them to attack like this. And so now it's been inscribed into the book as an absolute statute. You got to make sure to blot them out. They're never going to be let go for this one. So even to this day in the, the list of commandments that people are supposed to follow, uh, there's, there's a commandment related to Amalek. So that's just a very prominent piece of the culture and the history. And, you know, it just goes to show there, there are such a thing as grudges, right? <laughs> Never let it go. But also the, the origins of Amalek, which we spoke about in previous chapters, as I mentioned, we get to see, you know, where they come from, their lineage. They are distant relatives, but they are the enemy now. So all because somebody didn't do what they should have done at the time and seize the opportunity for a greater merit. In any case, that concludes this week's Torah portion for Beshalach. Thank you for listening. I hope you found it educational. Uh, particularly, I think what a lot of people don't really pay attention to is, you know, you know about the stories of things like the parting of the sea. You know about this. You know about that. Moses keeping his arms up. You know all these little pieces. But it's missing some of the finer details a lot of the time, especially when we see dramatizations of these things, like when Moses splits the ocean open, right, with the power of God or splits open the sea, that is something that is often portrayed as a very instantaneous moment, but it, there's actually a lot more going on with it, and I just think that's kind of interesting. When you read the original text, you can see how it has been modified by other interpretations and representations that aren't quite accurate because it's not so easy to detail it the way that they would in these texts here. In any case, that's it for this portion. Thanks for tuning in. I hope you've enjoyed, and I hope to see you next time. This has been Shmuel Moshe with the weekly Parsha cast, Parsha Beshalach. As always, I hope you're following along, but if you want to read the text for yourself, you can visit Chabad.org. But beyond that, that's it for this episode. So I hope that you'll tune in next time and continue to study Torah and learn from the ways of our ancestors. Until then, this has been Shmuel Moshe. Baruch Hashem.